Hello and welcome back to my mom's basement. It is Robbie Fox and I am here with my first interview of 2022. This is someone that I've wanted to get on the podcast for a while, someone that I'm a big fan of. It's the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion, Trevor Murdoch. Trevor, you must have had a great 2021. How are you? I'm a big ball of joy, man. I'm, uh, I'm fired up, ready to go. The new year, stepping in as world champion. Uh, 2021 obviously was a great year for me, but I'm hoping to make 2022 even better. Yeah, so you recently won the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. Well, not so recently anymore, I guess, but you spent some time in the NWA. You've been in the company for two and a half, almost three years now. One of the most coveted championships in all of wrestling, without a doubt, the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. What was that moment like for you 20 years into your career winning it? It was one of those moments that uh, in the pro wrestling business, you, you don't get excited about nothing until it actually happens. And in my mind, I, was, I knew where I was headed. I knew what I wanted to do, but it really, it really took the one, two, three for me to believe that I could really do it and stand in the middle of the ring with the belt in, in my hand. Uh, my wife and kids were there. Those guys have been through so much horse shit with me when it comes to wrestling. Um, and then to have Ric Flair come in and, and hand me the belt, like you really, I really couldn't have asked for a better moment. Like you, there was no, there was nothing missed. You know what I mean? If, you ask yourself what a perfect moment is that is a perfect moment wrestling at the chase after 37 years wrestling at the chase in st louis being the main event for the world title winning the world title and have flair come in and hand me that title you really couldn't ask for a more perfect moment and this comes after your first retirement right like you thought you were gonna leave wrestling in the rear view and then what, what brought you back? Was it the NWA calling you up? Was it you he hearing about the NWA kind of reforming? How did you get back into it? I had heard about the NWA reforming and been watching a little bit. Um, but that was right about the same time that Harley uh, started to take a, a downward turn. And he actually um, ended up passing away. And when he passed away, I just, I kind of felt like that was a good opportunity for me to kind of step away from the business. It, kind of seemed full, full circle for me um but what happened was nick aldis who was the world champion at the time dave lagana who was the executive producer at the time they actually came to harley's funeral to pay respects to harley and they after the funeral they both pulled me aside and, and just asked me like you know what are you doing now and i you know i basically told them like i'm i'm a round peg in a square in a square world i think i'm i'm done and they said, no, like, we need to get you down to Atlanta and you need to come in for one match. Even if you don't wrestle a match, we'll have you produce a match. We'll have you do something like you're just it's, it's a waste for you to sit at home. Just come down to Atlanta and uh, just do one one show. And I'm a rest, a pro wrestler. I'm, a, I'm an OG. I bring my gear everywhere I go just in case. And sure enough, when I walked into the building, the first thing they asked me was, oh, do you have your gear on? gear and I was like yeah I have my gear and they go well, you're wrestling Ricky Starks tonight and you know that was my first match there and that kind of <clears throat> the people there that match that moment everything um when I got into the back Billy Corgan was there um just a couple of the other boys were there and they're like you got way more in the tank than what you, you know you're giving yourself credit for and uh they just like let's you know you ready to do show two I was like yeah let's go and it was you know just kind of steamrolled from there brother you mentioned Harley Race, and your Twitter cover photo is a great side-by-side -side of you and him wearing very similar jackets with the NWA World's Heavyweight Championship. How did that bond form, and what was it like throughout your career to go from fan to friend? Um, you know, uh, obviously, when he decided he was going to open up his wrestling school, like, he was the only guy in the area for me, like, that had any reputation that, you know, really... Uh, it's kind of like going to a job and you want to work at a really good job. The people before you need to have the experience of that job. And Harley fits, checks all the boxes again. You know, he's done it all. He's done done everything and he's been on top. So I wanted to go to his, his school. Um, and then, you know, the first couple, three months, man, like they were tough. He didn't, you know, he was tough on us. He didn't give us anything. I got sick every single day of training. And that's not, I'm not like exaggerating, like every single day I puke. Um, but that was because he was pushing us hard and I want, didn't want to let him down and I wanted to let him know how badly I wanted to be there. 
but over time, you know, after a while, you know, I started going to his house in the off times. I started spending some holidays with him. We, it became a, even though he was my boss and he was my mentor and my trainer, we became family. Um, and I, I spent a lot of special moments with him at different times where, uh, you know, he, he may not have opened up to most people. Whereas with me, he was, he was open and honest with me and felt comfortable with me. Uh, I always used to laugh because you could tell um, if there was, if he was talking to somebody he cared about or talking to either a fan or somebody in the business, because Harley was a very soft-spoken individual. And if somebody from the outside joined in under the conversation, whether it be a phone call or a fan would step up, you would immediately hear that soft-spoken man go right back to Harley race and let everybody know who the fucking man is. <laughs> and then as soon as they would, they would leave, or they would get out of the conversation. He would go back to being the soft-spoken, you know, Harley that I know. And um, so I would, I would, I would find that very entertaining because I would watch it happen. Especially after you watch it happen the first time, you start seeing the signs. Uh, you know, when it happens again, you're like, oh, watch this. And sure enough, he'd flip that switch every time. I feel like his style has held up so well. You hear wrestlers today. CM Punk is a big one that always goes back and credits Harley Race with uh, being an inspiration for them. What do you think it was about his wrestling style actually in the ring that does hold up so well? Harley never wasted a move. Like he never wasted time. He never, um, a lot of guys in their head, when they go in there to wrestle, they have this idea in their head, things they want to do, things that like if they can get it, like they can get it in, they want to get it in. Um, Harley was an opportunist. So and he was so knowledgeable about pro wrestling. So if he was, you know, on one part of your body and he see an opportunity to take advantage of another part, he would do that. Um, also, Harley was, was Harley in the ring and outside of the ring. There are so many stories of guys trying to uh, not just test Harley, but test pro wrestling. And I mean, I'll give you a really quick, a really quick story here. Uh, Harley's world champion. There's a bunch of bikers that were given all the boys, all the wrestlers a hard time during the show. And then after the show, the bikers uh, stuck around and they were basically calling out Harley and, and you know, uh, just saying some foul things to him. And they said they wanted to be pro wrestlers. And the promoter went in the back and told Harley, hey, there's some bikers out here. They're causing us some trouble. They say they want to be pro wrestlers. And Harley puts down his cigarette, his Marlboro Red, and puts it down calmly walks out to the ring slides in the ring gets in and tells one of the bikers to get in the ring you want to be a pro wrestler and, oh yeah yeah the guy's being a smart ass and, and harley just calmly casually well you know you got to learn how to, to lock up so you got to put your hands up here like this and that guy goes to put his hands up here and harley just steps in and wham just head butts him right in the head takes his nose and just flattens it splatters it across blood everywhere guy knocked out the other bikers are out, you know, they're pulling their buddy out of the ring. And Harley looked at him and goes, if you want to fucking take me on, take me on now. And none of those bikers wanted any, any trouble. It didn't want to mess with him. They knew right then and there he was, you know, in their minds, he was the world champion. And he did that inside and outside of the ring. He carried himself as the world champion. And if you tested that or you called him out on, he would let you know quickly who he was. That's true. And you got to the real deal. He's the real fucking deal. Even even at 70 years old, you know, and he's like, he still considered himself the world champion. I'm the eight time NWA world heavyweight champion. And that says a lot for him and, and what he's done in the business and who he is as a person and how he took, how serious he took the business. And a lot of guys need to kind of maybe take some notes. <laughs> for the young fans who should take some notes on Harley Race, do you have a favorite match that you go back to that you watch over and over again of his? I, it sounds a little cliche, but the Flair Harley match at Starcade, and the reason why is because I I've hit up both Rick and Harley about the backstory about all of that leading into that. Like I've talked to Har I talked to Harley probably a hundred times about that match about, about what you know what was going on behind the scenes that led up to that, not only with him and Flair, but what was going on with Harley at the time. Um, and the fact that Flair was kind of the next chosen guy, like he was the next guy to, you know, carry the ship. And he knew that <clears throat> he had to go in there and make that guy. And a lot of wrestlers these days don't look at it like, 
that. They don't look at, you know, in pro wrestling, there's always going to be a shift. That's how we stay relevant. That's how we stay exciting to people. And eventually the top dogs are going to have to step out of the way and let somebody else move in there. That's just how our business works. Um, a lot of guys in the business, you know, they get all butt hurt and shit when they know that like the next guy is coming. They want to give them a hard time or make it difficult for that next guy when in turn he should be passing the torch um, because it's not, a, not just about him. It's about the company. Um, as wrestlers, especially as a world champ, you represent not only yourself, but you represent every wrestler that steps in the ring for that company. Um, and sometimes you've got to make the hard decisions and you've got to make um, some tough choices and, and do things you don't like. But as champion, you need to put a smile on your face and, and do it with pride and respect and professionalism. You mentioned working with Billy Corgan before as well. Obviously, he runs the mm -hmm. NWA. Um like many people, a fan of his music and don't know a ton about how he views wrestling just because like he's not out there talking about wrestling as much as most promoters are. What is it like working with him as someone who obviously comes from almost like an old school wrestling background? Well, he's a big fan of pro wrestling and he's a big fan of what wrestling used to be. And that's what he's, he's trying to create a version of that with the NWA. Um, he is you would think that a guy like i'm i'm just like you guys like i remember when i was a kid you know not a kid a teenager and the smashing pumpkins were the hottest thing out there and you're watching this guy and he seems so um unattainable you know what i mean like he seems like somebody you can't even get close to so when i stepped into the nwa i was a little reserved and you know still a big fan and i'm like oh my gosh like i'm excited but also, too, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, another rock star, another another guy with money that wants to get into pro wrestling. I mean, I've I've dealt with like 30 of those tax time pro you know promoters that get their taxes. Oh, I'm gonna start up a wrestling business. So a part of me um, was a little reserved until I kind of sat back and just listened to him talk and just kind of got a feeling for him uh, because I've, NWA is really important to me. It's from my background. It's bred into who I am <clears throat> so I, I didn't want to go out and promote a company that I care about so much and not understand wh where the boss's mindset is and where it's going uh that only took one one tv taping and all those worries were put aside uh to see a guy who's so knowledgeable and uh, such a student of pro wrestling um but also not so hung up on his idea his way uh he's he's willing to be open and you know he has an idea but he's willing to expand on it and he's willing to let the wrestler be creative with it and for me that's that opens up a ton of other avenues because there's no leash on me i can do whatever i want within the bound within my boundaries um i can be creative i can be uh i can do things off the cuff i can do things that feel right and to have a boss like that and to have somebody that's a platinum selling recording artist be so easy to talk to and so easy to get along with, it makes my job like a 10 times easier. And it makes me excited about going to work uh, because I have somebody who's just excited to be at work as I am. Yeah, I'd be remiss not to mention you spent a bunch of years with the WWE and also worked with Vince McMahon, who... There's a billion stories about he's the top of the top in wrestling promotion. What was your relationship with Vince like? Um, I had a very, uh, it was a weird relationship. Like I, I assumed when I first got with the company, like I'd go in and I'd meet the boss and I'd talk to him and we would, we would get whatever I'm here to do lined out and, and, and in the, that direction. Um, I was there for like three or four months before I had my first conversation with Vince. Um, he has a lot of people surrounding him. He has a lot of people that want his attention. Um, and there was a lot of things that were micromanaged there that I felt like shouldn't have been. Um, and, and I, and the interactions I did have with Vince were, <coughs> excuse me, were a little strange. Like one time Lance and I were talking to a writer outside of Gorilla and we were just talking to a writer about ideas and stuff. And Vince got mad at somebody that was in the ring while TV was going on and left Gorilla. Well, Lance and I are the first two guys that he's seen and he just starts chewing on us, you know, saying my newest, youngest tag team, not even watching the show. 
what the fuck? And I mean, cussing at me, just making, making just this big fucking scene in the, in the locker room about us not watching the show, even though we've been watching the show the whole time. And we just seen the writer walk by and like, Hey, here's our opportunity. Let's talk to him for a minute. It didn't, none of that mattered. So it, like, I, it really threw me off and I, I kind of like, what an asshole. But then, you know, there were times where things weren't going that well for us on TV and I tracked him down and I sat down with him and had a, an honest conversation and he was honest and upfront with me. He's just a weird cat to get to know and understand. Um, and I never was able to build that personal relationship with him. Maybe that's why I didn't last, you know, any longer than four years. But I just could never, I could never get to know him. Or I just could never get over that bridge of getting to know who he was and, and, and getting close to him. On the flip side, then, I guess, who in WWE did you learn the most from in those four years? Arn Anderson, without a doubt, Arn Anderson. Um, me being a big fan of Arn, period. And uh, just, I'm a world, I'm, I'm an old school guy, so I've watched a ton of Arn's Orange wrestling. Um, so anytime we had a question, not only about the business, I had a question about the business, whether I had a question about a match, he was my go-to guy. Um, I remember specifically just one time um, we were wrestling, we're about to wrestle the Highlanders. And if you look at the, the size difference between Lance and I and the Highlanders, there was a, a, a huge, huge difference in height and size and, <coughs> excuse me, and um, we went to Arn, and we were kind of confused on on what our direction should be with them. We didn't really know what to do with them. And 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 in two minutes, Arn pulls his glasses down. And uh, boys, uh, if I were you, I, I'd wrestle them like the sheep herders, who turned out to be, you know, I'm talking about who they turned out to be. No, they did. They did. Oh, the bushwhackers. Them. Bushwhackers, right? He goes, I would wrestle them like the bushwhackers. And as soon as he said that, like Cade and I, like the light bulb went off in our head. We were like, oh shit, okay, okay, that explains it. That's that's all we need. That's all we need. And it just that two minute conversation took all the puzzle pieces and put them in the right place for us. So uh, he was our go to man on almost everything. And, you know, there were a lot of times that, like, he even agreed with what was going on. wasn't right. Like, you know, Arn, this is bullshit. This is this, this is this. And he'd look at us and go, you boys are completely right. But here's the reality of the situation. Yeah. You got to, you know, and you got to stay, you know, and even though he agreed with us and we were in, we knew we were in the right, it didn't matter. It was the fact that this is how things go here. And, you know, you have, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, you know, and, and that's another reason why I've never gone back. Everybody's like, when you're going back, when you're going back, when you're going back, fuck, I'm never going back. And it's not because like, it's not about money. It's about, about me being happy. That's the most important thing to me is being happy because being happy affects everything else in a positive manner. It affects my thought process and it affects my wrestling, everything. I just want to be happy. And my soul is not worth going up there for a couple hundred thousand dollars. Speaking of happy things, speaking of uh, good things in your career, what is your favorite match of your career? Um, I I don't have any one favorite match. I have several like matches because as a wrestler, you create these moments, these moments in times where people are either on their feet going nuts and they feel every bit of it, or they're they're sitting down and they're angry and pissed off at you. Um, I can throw the, the tag match I had in with the Hardys in St. Louis, the pay-per-view. Um, my hometown, my area, my people with the biggest company in the world at the time, wrestling for the world tag team titles with the hottest tag team in pro wrestling. Uh, like you can't, just those guys walking out to the ring was just amazing. You know what yeah. I mean? And just the feeling in the ring and the people and the energy and the emotion that was going into it. Like you can't beat that shit. But then you fast forward 15 years later, and then you, I've got a match with me and Nick Aldis. And we're stepping into the ring, Coruscant Ballroom, wrestling at the, you know, at the chase, you know, Harley's world, Harley, you know, the same title for Harley. Like, you can't, those moments, they, they all have their own little place and time. So it's hard to pick the, the favorite, the number one, because at that time, bro, that was, 
they were all special to me. You know what I mean? It, you, there is nothing cooler than standing in the middle of the ring and having 20,000 people chant your name and, a, you know, the millions at home watching you do what you do and all your hard work uh, at the right time. Everything's clicking right. It's all that payoff, and you're like, fuck yes. Like, this is it. This is my money shot. Like, it's almost worth, you know, it's it's worth the it's it's worth more than the money sometimes. It's just having that payoff of yeah, everything's gone right, everything went right, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do, everybody's it's just right. Yeah, that makes I, any sense. I mean, I can't imagine. And now I want to talk about NWA in 2022. We recently right. saw Matt Cardona came in, attacked you. The forbidden door, quote unquote, seems to be well open for the NWA. Uh, yes. What do you expect for the NWA in 2022? And, and breaking news, I just read the NWA is returning to YouTube, announced Fight All Access Pass as well. So check that out. NWA you're going to be able to see it everywhere in 2022. And that's the goal for us is to get as many, as many eyes on us as possible. Um, we are, we are not confused on who we are and where and what position we're in. We, um, we know that we have to build an audience. Um, and the most important thing for us is to not rush that shit. You know what I mean? Not force anything down people's throats. Don't we, um, we're a company that, 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 is built on payoffs that you get a payoff on everything you see. Whereas in pro wrestling, you, you don't get the payoffs that people tend to want sometimes. Um, our, we know that we're a smaller company and we're not going to try to wear bigger shoes in a bigger arena than what necessary, than what's necessary. We went from four pay-per-views to six pay-per-views for 2022. Um, and we're going to try to make that, go bigger and go bigger but we again we don't want to we don't want to try to be big a little you know big fish and in, in, our little fish in a big pond you know what i mean if that makes any sense uh, we worked really hard to establish who we are and establish our fans and to present old school pro wrestling that's who we are we're not we're not trying to reinvent the wheel we're not, not trying to compete with anybody else we're staying in our lane and we're the best at what we do. And that's tell old school pro wrestling stories. Something like, here's the biggest, the biggest catch for me is that when you watch a TV, any TV program, you should be able to watch it and maybe you miss the first couple episodes prior to that and be able to know the story of what's happening in front of you. Um, whereas other companies, when you go to watch their TV program, if you missed last week, you may not understand what's going on this week. Um, whereas NWA, we, we garner a lot of pride in the fact that you can watch our TV show, put it on and understand everything that's going on right there, right there on the TV screen and enjoy it for what it is. You know what I mean? And that's what we're going to grow on. That's what we're going to try to expand on and make bigger for us. I think that's a great message, everyone. There's no better time to check it out than right now. Hop in. You'll understand everything that's going on. You could go back on the NWA YouTube, watch the old episodes. There's a bunch of stuff out there. There's a bunch of content out there. Trevor, thank you so much for joining the show. This has been a great conversation, and I look forward to your 2022. Right on, Robbie. Thank you, buddy, for having me. I appreciate it, man. 